Hello, I'm Susan Weinstein, Co-Executive Director for Families for Depression Awareness. We're so pleased that you're joining us for our webinar, Caregiving from a Distance, How to Support Someone Who Lives with Depression. Let me share a few announcements at the outset. One, we expect that the webinar will run for about an hour and 15 minutes. We will also have the webinar available on demand shortly after we conclude. Number two, you can download the handouts from the link on your screen. There are two different uh, handouts. One is the um, slides. The other is um, a legal fact sheet. Number three, we'll have a question and answer session later in the program. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions with their registration. We will also be taking questions during the live webinar, so please type in your questions anytime as we go through the presentation. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Or during the webinar, in addition to hearing from Dean Sandra Edmonds Crew and Dr. Janine Cross from Howard University School of Social Work, we'll also be playing clips from our interview with Rose Tanalia Dunn for, about her experience of caregiving for her adult son from across the country. You can watch Rose's entire interview on our YouTube channel, FFDA1. As a bonus, Rose will join us for the questions and answers at the end of the program. After the webinar, please take a few minutes to complete our survey. Your input helps us know what we're doing well and where we can improve. As an incentive, we'll be sending copies of our Helping Someone Living with Depression or Bipolar Disorder, a Handbook for Families and Caregivers publication to the first 100 survey respondents. We sell the handbook through our website for $9 plus shipping and handling, so you'll be getting quite a deal. And we will greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, this has been a tough year for everyone, and we hope your families are safe and healthy. Today, we aim to provide you with information and strategies so that you can reach out and provide effective support to the people you care about who are living with depression. I hope you will consider supporting the work of Families for Depression Awareness with a tax-deductible contribution. The easiest way to do this is to use your credit card on our website at familyaware.org slash donate. All right, so let me go back. Here we are. Uh, we're going to talk for just a couple of minutes about Families for Depression Awareness. Families for Depression Awareness was founded in 2001 to dispel stigma around mood disorders and provide information for family caregivers so they can provide effective support for their loved ones. Our mission is to help families recognize and cope with depression and bipolar disorder to get people well and prevent suicides. Mood disorders affect everyone in a family, not only those with the diagnosis. In addition to passing along a higher likelihood of having a mood disorder, parents can find it hard to engage with their children, to take care of household chores, to do their work, and sometimes even to get out of bed. Other family members might be wearing themselves out, making up for the other's reduced capacity. We believe that each family member should be able to have their needs identified and addressed. Our website at familyaware.org is the hub of our educational resources for caregivers. It has a wealth of information, tools, and actionable advice to help caregivers provide effective support to others while also tending to their own wellness. FFDA was one of the first mental health organizations to share names, images, and stories of real people living with depression or bipolar disorder. Each year, we add to our library of honest and inspiring accounts of families facing the challenges of mood disorders and suicide. We also tap experts from across the country to keep us up to date on developments in mood disorder treatment and caregiver strategies, then share that information with you. Also on our website, we have um, webinars like this. FFDA has been providing free webinars for caregivers nationwide for a decade, but only recently began building out our library of programs. Our teen mental health series includes teen depression, non-suicidal self-injury, substance use, and anxiety. Our two webinars on bipolar disorder take viewers from the basics to more advanced issues for caregivers. And our adult depression webinars cover stress and mental health in the workplace, symptoms of depression, and topics that will help caregivers choose and use health insurance. In addition, we have videos we've been adding to our library on YouTube with three recent family interviews to add to the expert interviews and how-tos and um, 
all of those other programs that we have. Very soon, we're excited to be posting our new video series on the stages of change. You'll hear a little bit about the stages of change in this webinar. As I mentioned earlier, we have publications. Our publications about bipolar disorder and depression combine educational content with personal stories so you get expert and firsthand perspectives on living with these mood disorders. We wrote our handbook on helping someone living with depression or bipolar disorder to replace our previous 16-page brochure. It turned out to be 60 pages, and it's jam-packed with information that will help readers to be effective caregivers. And remember, we'll send a handbook for free to each of the first 100 people who answer our survey and provide us with their United States mailing address. The website also offers a free depression and bipolar disorder screening test, a mental health family tree to help identify patterns that may indicate bipolar disorder, a depression wellness analyzer for tracking treatment progress, and our brand new caregiver stress test to measure your level of stress and get resources to help you manage it. When Families for Depression Awareness staff met in the fall of 2019 to discuss what topics we would want to cover in our 2020 programming, we identified a recurring theme of caregivers who are trying to help their loved ones with depression who lived elsewhere. We did some preliminary research and found studies about caregivers experiencing depression, but not caregiving for a person living with depression. We decided to develop a webinar and materials to fill this void. Little did we know that COVID-19 would mean that your loved one living a town or two over would be as accessible or inaccessible as if they were living hours away. We're glad for the opportunity to be unveiling this new con content at a time that will be of use to more people than usual. Whether due to physical distancing requirements, a job opportunity, immigration restrictions, retirement, school, marriage, or any of myriad reasons, many of us have a loved one who lives far away but needs support around their depression. We can't always be physically close to those we love and want to support, but how can we be effective caregivers for our loved ones living de with depression when we don't live near them? If you're not there and can't be sure of what's going on with them, how can you know what they need, what you can do to support them, and whether they're safe? You're definitely not alone with this. Uh, approximately 11% of Americans who provide care for a family member who's older, ill, or has a chronic health condition live an hour or more away from their loved one. If your loved one lives away from you, you might have concerns about their mental wellness, how you can help, what if you can't help? You know, what, if anything, are they doing to get or stay well? Do they have treatment? Do they have a treatment team? Are they on the right treatment and sticking with it? What can you do if their depression isn't well managed? Does your loved one have access to supportive people and social networks? Are you being unsupportive by saying no when the person asks for something you don't feel you can do? We'll be addressing these kinds of questions over the next hour and a little. Here's our agenda. We'll start off with a little bit about caregiver self-care. We'll go through the caregiver's role, identifying the problem, um, and helping with finding care. We'll talk some about communication, which is made more difficult uh, in many instances when we are uh, physically apart. We'll just touch on some legal and financial issues. We'll loop back to a little bit about FFDA, and then we'll have some questions and answers. From all of this, you should rest assured that there are strategies for providing effective care to a loved one living with depression who doesn't live with you. We'll review these strategies, but first, let's talk about self-care. And for that, I'd like to turn it over to our featured presenters. Let me introduce them. Sandra Edmonds Crew is Dean and Professor of Social Work at Howard University. She's also an NASW pioneer. Dr. Crew holds a Master of Social Work from the National Catholic School of Social Service and a PhD in Social Work from Howard University. Dr. Crew held leadership positions for 20 years in the field of public and affordable housing. She currently holds several board positions, including the Maryland Affordable Housing Trust, American Association of Service Coordinators, National Association of Deans and Directors, and Home Care Partners. Dr. Crew is an ethnogerontologist with a focus on caregiving across the lifespan. 
She formerly held position of director of Howard University Multidisciplinary Gerontology Center. Dr. Crew is principal investigator of a SAMHSA mental health awareness training grant. Janine Cross is a clinical social worker who is in private practice in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and the District of Columbia. She's an assistant professor at Howard University School of Social Work, and her research interests include maternal child health, health disparities, and family support for medically fragile newborns. Dr. Cross holds a Master of Social Work and a Bachelor of Social Work from Temple University, a Master of Business Administration with a Graduate Certificate in Healthcare Administration from Rosemont College, and a Doctor of Clinical Social Work from the University of Pennsylvania. She is a former Health Education and Leadership Scholar, Health Policy Postdoctoral Fellow with the National Association of Social Workers, Dr. Cross has a mayoral appointment with the District of Columbia Maternal Mortality Review Committee. Dr. Cross is the co-investigator of a SAMHSA Mental Health Awareness Grant and is a certified mental health first aid trainer. My pleasure to welcome them to the program and turn it over to them. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is Sandra Crew uh, for the introduction. Uh, and certainly it was an extremely thorough introduction for the both of us. And we are delighted to be here from Howard University to present uh, to you. Uh, in addition to what was said about me, probably what what is most important is that I, too, have been a caregiver. I cared for my mother with Alzheimer's uh, for about 10 years, and at least seven of those 10 years were from a distance. So five, she was five hours from me. So I truly understand what it means to be a caregiver and caring from a distance. My, uh, my mother also suffered with depression, so I have a good sense of what's the journey. And I really do describe it as a journey of caregiving because the reason when we think about caregiving, it is not just starting from one point and getting to another point. It is the uh, parts in between that also uh, really inform the caregiving experience. Today we hope that our presentation will reassure you that you are not all alone and the importance of accepting support we will discuss, including self-care. Think of self-care as support. So when we think about uh, caregiving, we think about stress, but yet sometimes caregivers don't acknowledge that they have stress. I'm one of those caregivers who would say, oh, no, I'm, I'm not stressed. I'm, it's, it's okay. Now, I may have had on a brown and a blue shoe, but I was not stressed. Uh, and the reason I wasn't stressed uh, very often had to do with what I felt my responsibility was. So, But as we begin to look at what's happening today, what's happening in 2020, we know that depression and stress is up. We know that the twin epidemics of COVID-19 and racism and social unrest have really added tension to all of us. We know that we're not only experiencing the uh, the depression or uh, that we are, uh, that's a source for many caregivers. We are dealing with the feelings that are evoked as we watch the television, as we experience loss in our family related to COVID-19, as we experience the loss of not being able to go into work, as we experience people who are angry, angry, because the world is the way that it is. All of these things add to our moments of, of downtime. So whether it's Black Lives Matter, COVID-19, can't visit my loved one in a nursing home, can't really have a proper burial for a person that meant so much to me, or just can't go over and reach out and touch someone. 
These are the common everyday experiences that really result in higher levels of depression. As the slide shows, there are four times uh, the depression symptoms were four times as common uh, during a mid-year study as they had been before. So we are really all impacted by stress and depression. So let's really, you know, continue the conversation. Uh, when we're talking about caregiving, as I said, uh, it is stressful. Despite some of us really saying that we got this, we're handling this, the data support that 40% of caregivers experience high levels of stress. This includes emotional stress. I know that as a caregiver for my mother who had Alzheimer's disease, I really experienced stress. And also, she experienced stress from my caregiving. And if you had seen the two of us together, you would have understood that we were engaged in mutual stress. Um, I often uh, denied it, as I said, because I saw caring for my mother as a spiritual responsibility. And actually, you know, who would complain about caring for their mother? That just didn't feel right. So therefore, I had this sort of guilt that I wasn't staying there with her. Uh, so I did everything I could to respond to her needs. And you as distance caregivers, I know you get this because neighbors would call and say, where are you? All of those kind of things go on. And you really are trying to live another life as you're trying to also live this life. So caregiving is stressful. So what I really want to kind of focus on is what are some of those factors that really relate to higher stress among caregivers? As you can see on the slide, that there are various reasons uh, that we are experiencing stress and particularly higher levels of stress. Certainly, uh, black uh, indigenous uh, populations and persons of color uh, are known to have uh, higher stress levels. But let me just kind of pause for that, pause with that for a moment, because there's also research that states our stress levels are not as high. And so there is a contradictory information, uh, but let me share why there's this difference. Sometimes uh, persons of color have experienced so much stress and oppression that the added burden of caregiving doesn't show with them as much. Other times, surveys really are able to pick it up. But also we know that, uh, that if you were chosen for caregiving versus you chose to be a caregiver, then that may be very different. Choice matters in how one feels about caregiving. So it's, it's critically important that we really think about the role that choice has um, and, and the role of caregiving. But again, I didn't make a choice. Uh, I, had, uh, I have three siblings. It seems like the choice was made for me and that I was pitching in and I was doing more, et cetera. And so sometimes the assumption is that you have made the choice, but the choice is really not all of your own. I know some of you experienced that. But also I wanted to point out that, you know, those who are, are caring for a, a relative also experience more stress. Very important to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, also, that if you are been do if you've been doing it for one year or, or longer, uh, that's more of a level of, of stress that you have to think about it. So, when you're thinking about uh, the factors related to higher stress, all of those things matter. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge that, without regard to racial or ethnic characteristics, those who have higher stress have poor health outcomes. So it's important that we pay attention to the levels of stress that we are experiencing and understand what some of those sources of stress are. So as we think about caregiving, it is uh, inevitable that we will begin to think about self-care. Uh, without regard to the reasons that you find yourself in the high stress zone. That's what I call it, the high stress zone. Uh, that you will, uh, it is critically important 
that you not pour from an empty cup. Uh, an empty cup really does mean that you have not invested in taking care of yourself. And as you know, uh, as you've heard it many times on, on a flight, that the most important person to take care of it immediately is self. So therefore, uh, as a caregiver, it's critically important that we not pour from an empty cup and we begin to think about caregiving as not selfish, but rather self-full. But let me give you some of the warning signs that will really uh, alert you to the fact that your cup is empty. When you have withdrawn from friends, family, and other loved ones, when there's a loss of interest in activities previously enjoyed, feeling blue, irritable, hopeless, and helpless are signs that your cup is really running empty. Changes in appetite, whether that means you're eating more or eating less. And I know a lot of us experience that during coronavirus and having to be at home and dealing with the stress and the stressors of the time. Changes in one's sleep patterns, uh, whether or not you, your circadian rhythm is off. Getting sick more often than, than usual. Feelings of wanting to hurt yourself or persons for whom you are caring for, or sometimes symptoms of, of caregiver burnout. And again, I remind you that there is help for those who are really feeling this level of distress. And then there is the emotional and physical exhaustion that accompanies caregiving. So I think it's uh, critically important that we are aware of the signs and websites give you this information of what are some of the warning signs. You don't have to have all of these signs to be experiencing caregiver uh, distress is what I call it, caregiver distress, when your cup is empty. Now, thinking about caring for your whole self, it's not – sometimes as a caregiver, we are on automatic pilot. I know out there you know exactly what I mean. You are on automatic pilot. So therefore, you don't pause and think, what am I doing for myself? But when we think about caring for the whole self, it really does include, as we say in social work, we talk about biopsychosocial spiritual, but meaning that we're looking at the emotional, the personal, the physical, professional, the psychological, and the spiritual. All of that comes together because we are all of those. We're not just one of those. We are all of those. Uh, now, for those who say, that's nice, Sandra. Really glad you mentioned that. However, I do not have time to invest in all of this self-care. I can't find another hour in my day. I say to you, I've been there, and my advice is that if you fail to find that time, you will harm both yourself and the person that you are caring for and caring about. It is really critically important. So sometimes finding the time is easier than you might think. For example, I, uh, when I was caring for my mother and I was teaching full-time and a dean full-time and I had many things to do, but one of the things I could share with my mother as I was caregiving uh, was that I was able to share my lecture with her. And I did this even when I was caregiving from a distance. I was able to say, Mother, this is what we're going to talk about in class today. So I, she would become a student. Uh, and that is really important, are you finding ways of, of combining the, this. Also, we, were, uh, we enjoyed gospel music. So we would have time that I would listen to the gospel music um, on the phone even with her. And then we would worship together in doing that. So there are ways that you can combine uh, aspects of your life so that you can make the time. Colleagues out there, it's critically important that you make that time so that you are caring for your whole self. So now let's move on to thinking about managing our expectations. You know, one of the largest eaters of time is when 
you have set expectations beyond what you are really able to deliver. So when you think about the stages of change, it really does allow you to understand more your loved one's process for making change, including being ready to get treatment for depression. Convincing a person, particularly if they have other uh, uh, concerns, that they have depression, it's not an easy journey. But we really have to think about uh, Prochaski's uh, uh, stages of change, thinking about pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and also realizing that relapses are possible within that whole area. I strongly encourage you to visit Family Aware, the website that talks about the stages of change, because it makes you focused on knowing that Change is not absolutely uh, going in one direction. Sometimes we regress, move forward, regress, move three steps forward. So when you're thinking about managing change and managing expectations, uh, we need to really invest in understanding the process. One of the things that I found, uh, particularly as a caregiver, often I would hold myself to time frames that weren't important. They were only important to me. I, if I had decided that I was going to have a two-hour visit, then I tried to stay uh, uh, true to that two-hour visit. So, therefore, it became my issue when I was not managing the time properly. It didn't matter to my mother. If I said I was going to make a call, hey, mom, I'll call you uh, around 4 o'clock, and I couldn't make that call, it was okay for me to call and say, hey, mom, let me call you a little later. So managing uh, expectations was really important. So I had to change from my world to her world. So as caregivers, we have to make the shift to the world of the person that we are caring for and about. That is critically important. So setting boundaries, as I've talked about, it has often been said that um, your word is your, your bond. And so part of what really drives us is that we are trying to live up to pre-caregiver expectations, and they may be very different during caregiving experience. So, but it is okay to raise the hand as the young lady is in the picture, picture and say, no, I can't do that. I cannot bring anything to the Thanksgiving meal. I am bringing self, and I am really will be glad to be, to be there. But very often people give you more to do rather than less to do because of your caregiving role. That's because you're so good at it. Because you're so good at it, they tend to give you more. So you really need to make sure that family members know that you are not the superhero. Your cape is torn and a little frag a ragged sometimes. So it's okay to acknowledge that I would love to do it, but not this time. So you have to find the polite way of saying no. Now, some of you have mastered that, and perhaps you can share it with others. Others are not as comfortable with that. But to respect yourself, you really have to focus on how do I say no when I am not able to, to do this. Reframing negative thoughts is so very important to this process. And I say that because, you know, very often we will say, uh, I'm exhausted. How about reframing it to say, you know, I think I need a 20-minute break, or I need a 15-minute coffee break, or I need a two-hour break. I'm putting the sign-up office closed, closed for caregiving. So being self-aware is critically important to the caregiver experience, and that means that you're investing in self-care and you know that you can't stay in the zone of negativity. So if you're feeling a bit down, embrace yourself and find others to help. They are waiting to help you. You just have to invite them in. So again, as I said, being uh, investing in self-care is really not being selfish, it's being self-full. 
You're, and and I uh, close this segment by really reinforcing the fact that you are not alone. There are other people who are out there, and they are there to support you. Social isolation is the enemy of self-care. You don't do a better job when you don't care for self. As you can see from the uh, slide presentation, about three-quarters of caregivers feel alone. And that is something that we really want to avoid. Literature on social isolation has stated that the health effects of being socially isolated are as damaging as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So imagine that. So as you take this journey in caring for an individual who is depressed, uh, know that you're not alone. We are just a phone call away. Uh, I will now turn, turn this over to my colleagues. Thank you, um, Dean Crew. Uh, hi, Dr. Cross. This is Susan. Um, I think we've just both hit the uh, button at the same time. I'm going to go ahead and um, oh. introduce this video clip from Rose. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, we were fortunate to interview Rose Tanalia Dunn, a Massachusetts caregiver, about her experience with her son who lives in California. Let's listen to Rose as she talks about one of the telltale signs that her son is suffering and her thoughts about self-care. was someone that said to me for years, I'm very emotional, as you can probably see. because this He was someone that said to me for years, I'm very emotional, as you can probably see, because there's little tears pouring down my face, but as I'm talking, um, he would say to me, I don't want to see your tears. You know, he had no, he had no tolerance for emotion. Well, it's because he had stu was stuffing all of his. And what, it, what we've come to realize, or what I've come to realize is that, and actually, and he has admitted to his self-talk is pretty nasty inside. And so when he's pushing back and being caustic on the outside, that's that's a sign to me that, oh, when he starts being abusive to me, he's really struggling because the noises in it, the voices in his head are so loud that now they're, they're squishing out to the people that love him most, right? And I think that's part of the caregiver thing too, is that you generally are the one of the people who love this person the most, and yet you you're abused because of it. You're gonna take the brunt of it. You do, you do, and it's um, so. One of the things I've learned through this process is how important self care is. And as a caregiver, there's this whole story that we tell ourselves about not being selfish and just giving and giving and giving till we till we have nothing left to give. And that kind of goes back to the the old airplane. You know, you got to put on your got to put on your oxygen mask first before you can help somebody else. But it's really, really true when you're caring for somebody who is depressed because they can suck you in like nobody's business. And if you're highly sensitive, you're, you're riding the waves with them. So talk about what it is that you, you did while you were in the throes of this in order to take care of yourself. And then you can talk more generally about your self-care as well. Um, well, I think it's important to have support. So, and that whatever that support looks like for you, if you have a large extended family, I don't have that. 
Um, I do have some very close friends who are probably tired of listening to me about my son. After a while, it's like Eonsville. Like, what else is new? This has been going on forever. Um, so you can exhaust people that way. Um, I think it's good to have some kind of a some kind of therapy. And for me, um, I actually have a spiritual counselor, someone who I can talk to about how I'm being affected. Um, that I meet with that I meet with on Zoom now monthly, um, and some kind of a support group, um, other moms and dads, if that's who it is, or um, if you're caring for a parent, or other people who are in a similar situation with you. Again, I'll just say it again: healing does not happen in isolation. So, as a caregiver, your healing, your healing, at the same time, your loved one is healing because depression affects the entire family and it affects the entire circle of this person. You know, it affects every friend that he has. It affects everybody. Hello, everyone. Um, this is uh, Dr. Janine Cross, and I'll be covering caregivers' roles. Caregiving for depression. Caregivers can help people with depression, and there's a lot of things that you can do. One of the things as a caregiver that you can do is recognize that there is a problem. Make sure that you get quality care and figure out how to pay for it. Resolve legal or financial issues. And one important skill is good communication, and we will share some tips about how to do that. Caregivers' roles. One of the major roles that you have as a caregiver of someone with depression is to help them recognize that there actually is a problem that exists. So what is it like to have depression? Um, people who have um, not experienced depression often cannot fully understand the impact of it. They don't understand its impact on a person's body, mind, and or spirit. Um, but there are a number of ways to describe how depression can make a person feel. It's not always about getting up and going or telling somebody to just, just snap out of it. Um, one description that we, uh, we hear often is that it feels like somebody is wearing dark sunglasses in spite of how bright or beautiful it may be outside. The person will only see darkness. Another analogy to think about is someone seeing through dark filter or a fog, and it's oftentimes it's a fog of neg negativity. Oftentimes it can feel like your body is weighted down um, and it takes great effort um, to do anything at all. Depression affects thinking as well. People with depression often experience cognitive challenges that is difficult that that is difficult, and they also have difficulty with thinking. Uh, the families for depression and awareness adopted an acronym. Um, Rome, um, and it's a shorthand for the kinds of functions affect, affected by depression. Reasoning, organization, attention, and memory. Again, those are reasoning, organization, attention, and memory. When we're thinking about the, those type of acronyms specifically, we want to be very clear here that when you're thinking about reasoning, we're thinking about how you're comparing things, analyzing things, how you're able to, 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 to think and conclude. And that becomes impacted when you're dealing with um, depression. When you're thinking about organization, your ability to plan or, or order things sometimes are um, impaired. And when you're thinking about attention, your ability to be present in the moment when things are going on can be compromised, and also memory, and that is particularly your ability to recall. Um, there's more information about um, Rome on the uh, Families for Depression Awareness as well as some additional res resources that we've been talking about thus far. Depression affects motivation. When a person doesn't believe that they can escape their emotional pain, or that people will be better off without having to worry about them, they may need support their motivation is compromised. People may not be motivated to, to get the treatment that they need. And, it, and it's not 
um, surprising because depression often involves a sense of hopelessness or an attitude um, from the person experiencing it. Sometimes they think to themselves, why do I even bother? When a person doesn't believe that they can escape their emotional pain or that people will be better off without having to worry about them, they may need additional support around them. They may need help understanding that they need treatment, and they may also need help evaluating their treatment options. Sometimes figuring out positive, whether the emotions that they're feeling are positive and, and or negative, the effects that those emotions are having on themselves and loved ones, and sometimes even sticking through um, the treatment plan and having support. Sometimes your role as a caregiver is helping them meet their own treatment plan and their own treatment needs. And so understand that depression is, is going to affect that person's motivation. So you may need to help them with finding a provider. You may have to help them if you're invited to their appointments, help them share medical and family history because, again, they're seeing through that fog. Sometimes they're seeing through that lens. Sometimes you need to help them with getting a diagnosis and getting an accurate diagnosis. Again, you're helping them with um, connecting to treatment and evaluating those treatment options. Again, helping them see how their behaviors and thoughts are sometimes positive and negative or negative. Again, helping them understand how they're experiencing the treatment and again, helping them stick through their treatment plan. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the symptoms of depression. Um, depression causes significant impairment or loss of function for at least two weeks. People can feel miserable. They can feel depressed, sad, empty, or irritable most of the day, nearly every day. And most definitely they'll lose interest oftentimes um, or lose interest in activities that they normally find pleasurable. Other indicators include changing in their sleep patterns. They can be sleeping too much or too little. You're going to see changes in energy levels and activity. Sometimes it'll look like unrest or fatigue. Sometimes they can't sleep. They also have these thoughts about themselves and their self-worth, oftentimes feeling guilty about a lot of things. Whether it's their fault or not, they're going to feel guilty. Their ability to concentrate or make decisions become impaired as well as physical health challenges too. Sometimes they'll have unexplained um, aches and pains. They can even have reoccurrent thoughts of death or suicide. They may have suicide plan and or suicide ideation. Um, this is not a good place to be. Um, and so we, you, we want you to understand that that down mood can last for a period of time um, and that you can help them through this period um, by understanding what some of the signs and the symptoms of depression are. And so your ability to make observations so that you're, you're, you're trying to get an idea how well they're doing. What do you observe and your knowledge of your loved one can help you with those observations and understanding those depression symptoms? Um, you will also get an idea of how to do better observations to understand what it is you're seeing. So what is it that you're actually looking for in terms of um, signs and symptoms? What are the things that you're observing for? One are physical signs. What, what does their hygiene look like? What, what is their dress? Um, do they look tired? Um, what are you seeing? And, and what you're observing is a change in function to what you, you've seen them previously. So you definitely are looking for changes in function from when they were previously functioning in a better um, in a better status. So you're looking at their demeanor. You're looking at um, their the content, the language that they're using. Um, you're looking at their affect. You're also seeing how their behavior is changing um, over time. Um, and that change that change of behavior can be sleep, as we talked about earlier, unpleasant attitudes. That behavior may also be withdrawn. And in the content, you're looking specifically at their language. Um, you want to get a sense of, of the words that they're using and whether they tend to be more negative. Um, executive functioning, how they're thinking, their memory, their ability to regulate themselves. And also you're looking at changes, again, from their current state. So you want to see changes from before. And you want to know that there is a significant change and their functioning is impaired. Those are the things that you're trying to observe for. You can also get input from other people in their lives. 
um, you want to talk to other people that are in their systems to make sure what you're observing is accurate and that other people may see it too. Those, those different people that you can ask include roommates. You can talk to their friends. You can talk to coworkers. And you can talk to a partner as well. Um, you can also think about people who are closest to them, such as, as a spouse, mother, parents, family, brothers and sisters and siblings. And you want to ask them what, what have they been noticing. Um, and, you, and you also want to think about making sure you get permission um, from your loved ones before making those inquiries because you want them to know that you're asking because you're, you care and you want them to know um, that you are worried about them. And so the other thing we want to think about when you're caring for somebody um, affected by depression is, is safety concerns and addressing safety concerns. So when harm to self or others is a concern. You want to make sure that you address safety concerns by checking in with providers, their providers specifically, asking if they are planning to take their own life, if needed, and safe to do so, contact their local police and request a wellness check-in. And if there is no immediate danger, discuss next steps and how you can support. And I understand here that this can be difficult, but remember you care about that person and you want to get them help. It's never comfortable when you to ask somebody if they um, want to change, want to hurt themselves, but it's still something you need to be mindful of. So again, check in with providers. You can report things like concerning behaviors that you may observe, changes in activity level and mood, frequency and or severity of symptoms, family history or mental health conditions, and uh, the pri provider may not be able to talk with you because of regulations and confidentiality and privacy, but they can definitely listen. And this is a, this is a difficult question to ask, but you have to ask the question, um, are you thinking of killing yourself or hurting yourself? If you are concerned that your loved one may be suicidal, ask them, are you thinking of killing them, killing themselves specifically? Ask follow-up questions such as, do they have a plan? Do they have the means to make the attempt? Take appropriate actions to initiate interventions. And, and make sure, again, that you contact their providers when there's urgency. There are also local mobile psychiatric services or the local police department you can utilize too. Wellness check-ins can occur through your local police um, department, um, and this is a check-in on your loved one. You want to make sure that they are well, and you want to make sure that these welfare visits occur when there are safety concerns. This is an option that is good to talk about ahead of time with your uh, the person that you're caring for so that they know that that's a plan that you will utilize if necessary. Um, and you also want to make sure um, that you let them know that you're concerned, and when you need to take that or utilize the wellness check, and it is only because you're concerned about their safety. And you also want to be sensitive to concerns about police interaction. What support would help? You know, it's important now to also think about asking the right questions. What can you do that can make you feel supported? That's a question you want to ask your, the person that you're caring for. What would it be helpful? Would it be helpful for me to come to you? Um, would you like to come home? You're trying to understand what is supportive to the person that you're actually caring for. You want to let your loved one lead. And so we want to now talk about more caregiver tips to help you be supportive with, your, with the loved one. Again, you want them to lead. As much as you are tempted to control the situation, unless there is a threat that your loved one will harm or kill themselves or others, it is generally best not to make decisions for your loved one but instead to be supportive and offer to make decisions with them. Um, you want to provide them with what they, what they need and what it is they say they need, not what you think they, they need, and that is very important. You're not there to fix them or their problems. You want to be there for them and with them in a way that feels right for both you and them. You also want to validate their experience. So you want to make sure that you let them know and understand that it is painful for them. Um, and it may be painful for you, too, as, as well, to, to see your loved one struggling. But you may also want to let them know that you are there to help them with what they are feeling. 
and that you also want to help them without them make, making them feel different. You want to make them feel that, that, that they're improving. You want them to feel better. Um, and you just want to keep reinforcing that, that you're there to help and you, you want them to be in a better place and feel better. And you want to continue to instill uh, that hope in them. You want to meet them where they are. Um, you want to ask yourself what kind of conversation would be appropriate at this point, what will be supportive for them, what will be constructive, and what will be productive with them. You also want to think about ways to help them find quality care and figure out how to pay for it as well. There are ways that, that you can help them. Um, you want to think about looking into local supports and treatment teams. This is you want to research and identify mental health clinics that are in the area, providers who take their insurance. You want to think about resources that may be available at their job or at their school, such as um, employee assistance program and counseling services. You want to connect them to telemental health providers as well as support groups. You also want to utilize nearby hospitals with, that have a psychiatric unit. You also want to think about crisis intervention units and or mobile crisis teams also if they are available in your community. You also want to think about possible spiritual commu communities to connect that person with. And you also want to think about outlets for socialization, socialization and engagement. And you also want to do a quick check and research and identify if there are any relatives or family and friends that are nearby for additional support. Um, there are ways that you can help Okay, depression symptoms can make it hard for your loved one to arrange and advocate for their own treatment. Remember that, but you can offer support to them. You can share your observations with them in a non-judgmental way, things that you see that are changes with them. You want to talk to them with, about their vision of wellness. You want to help them feel equipped and confident in advocating for themselves. You, again, want to research those treatment options, such as those mobile crisis units that are there and available for them or local mental health providers. You want to provide support around medication if they are prescribed and need medication to help them cope with the symptoms. You want to encourage productive use of therapy, help with logistics, and offer to help with care coordination. Um, paying for the care with insurance is also something you have to think about and plan in advance. You want to look for a provider in your loved one's insurance network. If there is not an appropriate provider available, you can advocate for out-of-network coverage with the insurance company. And also remember, many insurance companies limit access to prescription medications or treatments. But you can appeal these decisions, and you can do that as the support person for the person with caregiver for, with the, uh, who, are, who is suffering for depression. Excuse me. Getting care without insurance. You want to ask providers if they offer an income-based lighting scale. You also want to think about if they accept uh, a lower payment and maybe negotiate those payments, and also ask providers if they offer a payment plan. You want to utilize community mental health clinics where available, and you also want to think about universities that may offer low-cost services, um, particularly for, um, by graduate students, to help them gain experience. You also want to look for um, local providers, and here's a um, web link, findtreatment.samhsa.gov, that will help you with local providers. And you also want to think about medication and tell your prescriber that cost is a consideration. Also check for income-based support through websites, and there's a website here listed. And now we're going to briefly talk about communication. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cross. You've covered a lot of materials, and I know that those in the audience, you know, you are taking it all in, so take a moment and breathe and breathe so that, you know, you are really um, uh, able to kind of focus uh, on this information because it's heavy information, and it's very, very important that in your role as caregiver that you have as much information as possible to help those you care for and care about. And Dr. Cross has shared with you ways that you can help. And that's the takeaway message. You're not alone in this, and there are ways that will be helpful to the ones that you care for. Communication is critically important as we think about this. Remember that communication is um, it's an extremely important aspect of caregiving. 
Sometimes we experience difficulties because we have not considered what effective communication is. Effective communication is more than exchanging information. It's about understanding the emotion and the intentions behind the information that's being shared. Clearly, conveying a message requires active listening. Some barriers to effective communication include stress, and we, I talked earlier about stress, a lack of focus uh, when there are distractions that are going on, inconsistent body language uh, when we are communicating with individuals, as well as negative body language. So those are some of the areas that we really have to be concerned with and make sure that we're involved in effective communication. And for a person experiencing depression, this is critically, critically important. Like most individuals, many of the cues are really nonverbal cues, so we have to really make sure that we are paying attention to that as we are communicating uh, with those that we love and care about. So let's talk a moment about communi communication technology. With COVID-19 and many of us being uh, socially uh, in a situation where we can't see each other, then we have really started to rely more and more on technology for our communication. Uh, there are many tools that are out there to help to communicate over a distance. Again, these tools will be critically valuable for you. For those of you who are already using them, you will become support, a support system for others who are using them. The screen gives you all of the different kinds that there are. Uh, we know the smartphone technology, Internet service, comfort, uh, but we have to get a comfort with these programs. But guess what? Just in case it is not your uh, comfort zone, you can lean into a growth zone by engaging with others who are really competent in this area. Remember I said earlier, they're out there and they want to help you. This is a time to reach out for help so that you can really use the technology if it's available to you. It helps you to address different time zones and different work school schedules. But all of the technologies there can be powerful for you. When I look at the screen, I now know that I use at least um, uh, 70 percent of them. You may have only mastered Zoom, but if Zoom works for you, that is the one that you use. So I, re um, I remember that uh, when I was caregiving for my mother at a distance and my sister was in Boston, we were able to use FaceTime. And the value of FaceTime is that she could chat with mom and see things that I didn't see. Sometimes a uh, Others can see things you can't see. So you can bring others into the caregiving experience and to the conversation. So it's important that you find ways for the technology to be helpful to you. Now, even though we're talking about technology, I don't want you to forget the power of pen and paper. The thing about pen and paper often is that a card, a person can continue to read it. It can uplift them over and over again. They can set it up so others can see that you, someone is thinking about them. So certainly uh, think about all the ways that you can use to really uh, communicate. And I don't want to uh, omit talking about ac an access to a uh, private space to talk. Sometimes when we're communicating uh, using technology, it is, it is very important that we know who's in the space. So confidentiality is critically important for those who have depression because sometimes, as Dr. Cross um, has said, paranoia may accompany it. So it's important that we protect the confidentiality of the person that we're serving. But See communication as your friend and a way to invite others into the caregiving role with you. So as we think about communication techniques, let me start with my golden rule. My golden rule is before I care how much you know, I must know how much you care. Communication techniques must start with trust 
and people realizing that everything you're doing is out of a sense of caring and love. So when we're thinking about uh, active uh, listening, we really do want to recognize that when we're actively listening, we're paying full attention to what the person is saying to us. Guess what, colleagues out there? Science has shown that if you favor your right ear, you may pick up on some more uh, of the emotions that are there. As strange as it sounds, the left side of the brain contains the primary processing centers for both speech, comprehension, and emotions. So since the left side of the brain is connected to the right side of the body, favoring your right ear can help you better detect the emotional nuances of, of what's someone is saying. So maybe switch that phone to your right ear when you're talking with someone. So it's really important that we sort of pick up tools like this and show interest in what the person is saying. Yes, you may have heard it before. I would say to my mother um, who had cognitive uh, concerns, she would say, Sandra, I may have already said this to you. And I would say, you know what, Mother, I probably need to hear it again. So tell me again, being encouraging uh, for the person. So as we begin to think about all of these, we really want to make sure that we're never judgmental. Because for you to give me information, to share information, I have to believe that you care about me. Remember my golden rules. So, And also be reminded that it is so important not to sweep difficult issues under the rug. They will resurface. So focus on them early. This may require practice, by the way. You know, it's, it's not easy to ask a question about whether you are contemplating suicide. You may have to practice that question with someone. So it is important that you really invest in solid communication techniques because it will generate trust and for those that you're caring for and caring about. So this is one of the most important things I will say to you uh, this evening. Help is always not help if it doesn't help. Now, I know that's a complicated and a convoluted sen sentence, but help, you may perceive it as help, but if it's not helping, it's not help. You may not be the best person to deliver some of the messages or provide some of the services that are important for the person to uh, do better. This relates also back to self-care because if you're not the correct messenger and then you become very frustrated because the message isn't received, no one is served well by this exchange. So it is possible, I, I recall in my caregiving experience, I would say something uh, to mother, and I would say it, and I would say it, and she would reject what I was saying, and she would really become hostile sometimes. Uh, but my brother could walk in the door, and he could say the same thing, and she would look at me and say, well, Sandra, why didn't you say that to me? Well, rather than to be concerned that she accepted it from my brother, I rejoiced in the fact that she was accepting the message. So sometimes it feels a little uncomfortable uh, when you are being accused of something and others come in and the same message is delivered. But remember, it's not about who delivered the message. It is about an important and powerful message being delivered. So it's okay if some things are not on your bandwidth. It is certainly okay. I recall trying to help my mother and to wash her hair, and that certainly wasn't a distance experience, but I realized that we were, we, not only was the hair going to be tangled, we were going to be tangled by the end of that experience. I also realized that some messages when I was a distance caregiver were better given by another sibling. I was not the right person to deliver that message. So it's really important to recognize that the message, the communication is what's important, not, the, not it always being you. 
that's where you can find that, you know, hour you were trying to find for self-care. Let someone else do the heavy lifting sometimes. So I'll now turn it back over to my colleague uh, to talk about uh, uh, to talk even more about you know when you uh, about the uh, area of legal and financial uh, uh, issues. Thank you, Dean Crew. Um, what are some of the legal and financial issues you need to think about when caregiving um, somebody affected with depression? Um, what kinds of legal issues might arise? Working within privacy and confidentiality laws, we provided example earlier where you may need to reach out to the providers um, and, and express your concerns, but we also said be, be uh, aware that you can, you can talk to them. They may not can share information with you, but they can listen. That's an example of privacy and confidentiality where they are not able to share um, health, protected health information with you, but you can share what your concerns and what you're observing. Um, insurance denials, inadequate network, and surprise billing. Oftentimes, insurances may deny um, claims, may deny um, a provider's claim, and then they may sub subject you with the bill. Um, sometimes your insurance company may not have a whole host of providers available in your, in your area to, to serve you, and that's a possibility. And also, you know, sometimes you get that surprise billing. You think that your copay is $25, but there may be a deductible of $75 that you didn't know about. And so please understand, this is this is um, not legal advice. However, we do feel that this information is helpful to you um, with your particular situation. Um, and we, we strongly encourage that you consult with a qualified attorney with experiences in this area, but we do want to give you some ideas of things that you may encounter as well so that we can better prepare you. There are also the issues of incapacity to make decisions. Sometimes some, sometimes a, care, a, a person that you're caregiving for, um, their functioning may be so impaired that they are incapacitated to make decisions. And so you need to consult with an attorney so that they can help guide you through and let you know what legal tools are at your um, um, disposal to help you maintain and, and provide the care needed for your loved one. Accessing government benefits oftentimes are legal issues. Sometimes you can make sure that you connect with your social service agencies and or your uh, local social workers to help you with uh, accessing government benefits. Also, there's disability leave or discharge from employment or loss of income issues too that you may need to consult with an attorney for. You need to make sure you know your rights and your caregiver and the person that you're caring for, their rights as well. Other helpful documents, HIPAA, um, waiver authorization, whenever um, um, a provider is sharing information from one provider to another, HIPAA requires that they get informed consent. And so we need to make sure that, you know, when information is being shared, um, that we're, we're um, adhering to the laws that govern informed consent and um, sharing of information. Authorizations of health and educational privacy, again, these are helpful documents that you need to know about, and also psychiatric advance directives, as well as healthcare po proxy and durable power of attorney. These are legal tools that help you provide the care that you need um, and gives you sometimes the authority to make decisions or the person who is suffering from depression can put their decisions out there before they become incapacitated. At least that way their directives are clear and, and in writing. Um, but again, you want to make sure that you concert, con, con, um, confer with an attorney or legal representative to help guide you in this area. In addition, financial support. Consider your willingness and ability to contribute toward the living expenses of the person you're caring for. Make sure you consider the treatment expenses and under what conditions you can help. Um, and be very mindful never to express resentment about any money that you spend for their care. And that is important because depression, um, people are already dealing with feelings of guilt. And so you don't want to compound how they're feeling. Um, so do a good examination of your willingness contri to contri contribute and under what circumstances to do that. And so next next step, um, this is the point where we want to recap with you some of the things that we talked about. Um, we want you to think about what you can do for your loved one and, and how you can help with their well-being as well as your own well-being. We want you to think about concepts um, that make sense for you. 
you want to work on um, making sure that you are committed to your own self-care um, and what self-care entails to you. You want to think about working on communication techniques, especially active listening, identifying resources for your your loved one, making calls to appropriate um, providers, you know, and other essential takeaways is making sure you gather contact information for your loved one's um, providers. You also want to make sure that uh, with their agreement that you report changes in behavior and affect. You also want to um, help to address insurance um, in, insurance issues and make sure that you're committed to keep learning. Um, and, there are plenty of things that you can do. And I would end, thank you, Dr. Cross, by saying you need to really uh, touch base with your support system because they are your greatest cheerleaders. Uh, so it's important as you're working with a person with depression to make sure that you are not all alone and that you are investing and in getting help from others. So uh, it's really been our pleasure to present this portion of the uh, session to you, and we hope that there's something that has benefited you in the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Crew and Dr. Cross. That was so much information, and um, I really appreciated the way you added to it with your own experiences, and it really helped it come to life. Uh, to the people who are listening, I made a typo, and I just want to clarify that. The slide that said um, about legal issues, that was not legal advice. So let's just leave it there. I know Dr. Cross said that, but uh, that was my my bad. So. I do encourage you to download the handout that we've prepared about legal issues because we really didn't have much time there. This is not an area of expertise, but we do want you to have things on your radar so that if issues come up, you know that, oh, that's something that I should look into. Um, please stay on the line. We're going to get to the questions and answers. Uh, we'll also share the survey link. Uh, and then when you fill it out, you may be one of the people to receive a copy of our caregiver's handbook. I just want to highlight a few features uh, on our website at familyware.org because they are relevant to what we are uh, talking about tonight, today, tonight. Um, definitely need to practice self-care. So take the tr stress test, and um, you should also know about our depression and bipolar test so that you can keep tabs on your own well-being. Uh, to work on your communication skills, uh, we're going to be working on a webinar about that uh, in the coming year. So you can practice, but hopefully we'll have some more to offer for you uh, in the not-too-distant future. We have resources for coping with stress. We have a whole lot of material about health insurance. When you are getting to the point where you want to see who you can involve in helping your loved one and how you're going to move forward, uh, you and your you and your a group and your loved one can put together your action plan. We have a template for that. Uh, to learn more about helping someone, just click on the help someone part of our website. Um, and we're really excited that we've just now made these stages of change videos available. Uh, I want to... Next slide, how about that? I want to thank you so much. I want to thank our presenters. Uh, Dr. Crew, Dr. Cross, and Rose. And uh, as I mentioned, we built this webinar from scratch, and we relied on the expertise of some very generous people. So I want to give a little shout out to Dr. Mari Carmen Benafar at William James College, Dr. Carol Dolan at the BU School of Public Health, Dr. Dan Hale at Johns Hopkins, and Dr. Joanne Riebschlager at the Michigan State University School of Social Work. You all have been um, real tremendous supports to us, and we appreciate it. I also want to thank our funders. We have corporate members. Uh, our sustainers are Takeda uh, and GeneSight, and our friend-level corporate members are Janssen Neuroscience and Sage Therapeutics, 
And for this program in particular, we received generous support from the Takeda-Lundbeck Alliance, the Allergan Foundation, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and Janssen Neuroscience. And I really want to thank all of you for spending this time with us. Uh, we would certainly appreciate if you would make a taxable tax deductible donation to us. It's uh, We're near the end of the year and we want to make sure that we close out strong. So if you're able to help, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, I just want to play one more clip. Let's hear from Rose about what she hopes others are going to get from hearing her story. And uh, you still have time to type in your questions. So let's go ahead. Educate yourself. Educate yourself about what depression is. And, it's, and it does affect everybody a little bit differently. Um, so the more you learn about it, the more you'll, the more you'll understand. And the more, you, um, the more you'll be able to see your loved one in their imperfection from, through your own lens of imperfection, right? Let go of the responsibility that you feel that you can solve it for them. That's a huge one. Um, that, that's kind of where I said I go back to. I don't say I'm sorry when he tells me that he's struggling anymore. I say um, I say I change it to like, oh, that's a bummer. Um, are you using your tools? What have you done for yourself today? How can you make that different? That's holding him capable and it's taking the onus off of me because it's not, ultimately I can't solve it for him. I can support him, but he has to do the heavy lifting himself. And I think there is a, if we do too much, which again, codependency queen, there's a learned helplessness. Mom's going to solve it for me. Dad's going to do, you know, dad's going to pay the bills. My brother's going to send me food. I mean, it, it's like, it's this learned helplessness. So you can sit back and just wallow in it. The only way to, to, uh, I don't know if you ever solved depression. The only the only way to get through depression is to get go through it. You can't avoid it. And by as a caregiver, by taking full responsibility away from that person, you're not doing them any favors. You're really not. Um, and then I think. Realizing, realize that healing is not a straight line. I mean, we think like, okay, here's the problem. Here's the solution. I'm going to go from A to B. Well, in my life, it goes, do, 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 do. I mean, it doesn't go in a straight line. So it's some days it feels like there's two steps forward. And then the next day there's two steps back. Count, don't discount. Just keep taking those steps forward. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Got to keep a little energy for yourself. Um, keep a lot of energy for yourself so that you can stay, so you can support them for as long as possible and, and just hold that space for them. All right, here we are at the long awaited questions and answers. Um, thank you so much, Rose, for sharing all of that. Um, and we actually had a question come in that uh, I think would ring true for you. So let me start with you. Um, how can I help when my adult son has anger and verbal abuse issues? <laughs> um, I guess my first question would be, is anger and abuse issues at you as the caregiver? Um, that's my that's my belief. Okay, and, and I that's kind of what um, I was trying to address in the beginning. In my in my first little clip there was that 
and this is a direct, pretty much a direct quote from my son. Um, when I finally had the courage to tell him that his treatment of me that did not look, it doesn't look like what love is to me, that doesn't look like love to me, um, he was kind of taken aback. And he said, please just know it's not personal. Um, how I treat you, the, voice, the noise in my head, the voice in my head says, is so much worse than anything I could ever say to you. And that helped me somewhat. No one deserves to be abused, and especially as a caregiver, you do not deserve abuse. It is your responsibility to tell him that you will not tolerate it. So not it's not uh, easy. Right. No, it's definitely not easy. Um, and you so, know, I'd like to add to that. You know, my do. mother, my uh, mother was also abusive, and I would always recognize that it was the disease and mm-hmm. not the person. And I would say that to her, Mom, I know that this is uh, Alzheimer's talking now and not you. But, you know, it still hurts. But I know Mm -hmm. if it were my mom that was talking, then you would not be saying those things. So it's still the confrontation about it, but it's confrontation with love. Agreed. I I think um, we want to be generous and fair, but at the same time, we don't want to be a doormat. Absolutely, I agree. We have to call it when it doesn't mm-hmm. feel good. And that, and right, that I mean, takes, a, takes a certain amount of courage to do that. I mean, it, it took me a, a number of years. <laughs> so give yourself so give yourself grace, but um, do you know? Take a step forward. Say, even if you just say, "Ouch, that hurt." Mm-hmm. All right. uh, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cross, I was wondering, uh, someone had put in a question that, you know, they know to ask the questions about, are you going to kill yourself or hurt yourself? Um, And they say no, but then they go ahead and attempt suicide. Anyway, are there any kinds of signs you can look for when, you know, Mm -hmm. they seem okay, but then they're not? Yes. Um, one of the things that I, I I noticed that when when you're doing when you're trying to observe people and understand, um, sometimes they don't speak as directly about suicide ideation um, and plan as we would like. And sometimes they use what I call coded language. And one thing you need to think about is sometimes we act di- ask direct questions like, "Are you going to hurt yourself? Do you have suicide thoughts?" They may respond no, but they may say things like, sometimes I feel like going to sleep and not waking up. Sometimes mm-hmm. I wonder what it would be like if 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 I wasn't here. Would anybody ever even notice that I'm not that I'm not here? Sometimes that's coded language, and that also can count as a sign of of suicide. Uh, ideation. Other things that we think about, if people start giving things away that is valuable to them, those are signs. Cryptic um, words um, and things like that. Um, writing letters. Some some people are artistic, and so they start drawing things that are very dark and themes of death. Um, and you may see that. Um, and so those are also signs when people are do not specifically say, "I'm going to hurt myself." Great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, mm-hmm. Dr. Crew, uh, someone had commented that um, the kinds of observations we were talking about, whether someone's eating or sleeping or losing weight or, you know, any of those signs, they said these observations may be impossible if you're living far from your loved one. I think that we would uh, challenge that some. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the observations are still possible uh, because Particularly, we talked about the use of technology, but we also think about the support systems. And support systems also um, uh, began to kind of tell us these things. I was really also talking about the signs of the caregiver having a burnout. So it's sort of paying attention to what's happening to yourself 
as well as paying attention to what's happening to the person you care for and about. But if the question is about the person that you're caring for and about, you have to always have people on the ground, uh, I would say, who can also help you to observe some of these uh, changes in behavior. I agree with Dr. Um, with Dean Crew. If you don't mind, I would like to add to that as well. The other thing is you can ask. You can ask how are you doing, and we talked about that in the PowerPoint when we talk about observable signs. So sometimes you may see those other signs that they're tired. You may see other signs that may help you probe and ask more questions. And so sometimes what you can't, you can't visibly see, now that you're more equipped with education about the symptoms, you can ask, are you having problems sleeping or are you sleeping too much? Um, how well are you eating? Do you have an appetite or are you eating, are you comfort eating? So I guess what I'm saying is there are some visible signs that you may be able to see that there's a change in functioning. And then what you can do is you can ask those additional probing questions to see if they are experiencing or having other symptoms that you may not can visibly see as well. Um, in terms of um, signs of depression, can you talk a little bit about uh, how those might manifest differently in um, different populations? I know you could talk for hours, but can you give us a, like, two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> now, when you say different populations, you're talking about racial, ethnic yeah. populations? Yeah, I mean, let's mm -hmm. say, for example, um, uh, black people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I want to, uh, yes, and I, and I, I want to, Pre preface it with stigma. You know, there is stigma related to mental health, and that stigma impacts everybody, regardless of racial background. But sometimes, depending on your racial background, determines how you deal with that stigma. Oftentimes, um, I think people of color are always encouraged and, 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 and pride themselves on being strong, resilient people, okay? And one of the things that um, um, actually Dean Crew will, will attest to this is she pushes back on that. She says maybe if we start working with the systems that we that we work with, meaning access to care, support, we don't have to be as resilient. It's a problem when you're being too resilient because the issue isn't you. Sometimes you get tired and burned out of always being strong, always caring the load for everybody, and that's that caregiving burden. You want to care for everybody in your family, and you, you want to be strong. You want to be resilient, right? And so it may it may show that way, and I think Dean Crew talked about that earlier when she said, you know, I'm not I, – I, I'm spiritually I'm supposed to do this. I, I can't feel this way. I have to push forward. But what we need to do is give people permission to say it's okay to not have to be strong all the time. You can lean on your resources, lean on your families, lean on, um, talk to a therapist. And so we have high expectation. But I think the under, under, um, the thing that that's really it, it is is stigma, and that's experienced by all races and cultures. But how they deal with stigma, and I think again we talked about that in the PowerPoint when we said you know just shake it off you know, um, just, you know, get it together. But we wouldn't say that if it was any other medical condition. So why are we treating mental health any different than a medical condition, which it, it is, it's a health care issue. And I think, Dr. Cross, what we will often hear uh, within the African-American community, if someone says that they're having struggles and they're having problems, we will share with them a worse time in history. You think this is something you should have lived when I lived, when we couldn't, you know, we had separate restrooms and all of those kind of things. And those were, you know, historical trauma kind of enters into the conversation. So the person is left feeling like, well, I dare not complain because people have had it much worse than I have had it. So I think that's very prevalent in the African-American community for us to minimize the pain by comparing it to other periods of greater pain. Thank you, Dean Crew. And I think spirituality also plays a role in that. Um, uh, oftentimes people will say, oh, yes, I'm having these symptoms, but I'm going to give it to, to the Lord or I'm going to give it to God. 
And as a support person, we say, yes, continue to give it to God, continue to pray, but let me help you. Do you need, do you need resources? Do you need information? Do you need to talk to a therapist as well? So we encourage them to engage in their spiritual support, but we also uh, encourage them to utilize the other support that may help them as well. All right, I'm going to give us our last question, um, but there are others, and um, I think we will try and put out a blog post or something that answers some of these. But um, uh, someone wrote with a that they help caregive for their friend, and their friend has problems with making financial decisions. But what are some indicators that um, he should suggest or she should suggest invoking the power of attorney so that she gets support in making these decisions like what what would be a clue that she is not presently able to make those kinds of decisions i well, I, I mean i i will okay go ahead yes i'm go sorry ahead. go ahead dr cross Oh, I just was going to add um, that, first of all, that is a good question, and, and, and that can be tricky. One, one, one thing we need to be very clear is that they have to be deemed incapacitated or in, unable to function, and usually that would be the need to call in a professional to do the proper evaluation to deem that person as not being functional. Um, and so my guess is if you feel like you, you, you're there, it may be best to get a professional in to evaluate that person because it, it, it would most likely have to be documented in order to to invoke it. And um, Dean Kru, I'm sorry, you you wanted to add to that, I'm sure. Well, I think it also starts with uh, we talked about having those difficult conversations, and sometimes you will see or um, uh, uh, bouncing checks. Uh, to the extent people still use those, overspending their account, and confronting the person with saying, you know, I noticed that uh, you don't have the money that you usually have. Do you need help? It always starts with asking if the person wants help. Um, and so it is possible that a person may acknowledge it and say, you know, uh, what I said with my mother is I say, you know, I know it's a struggle keeping up with all these bills. That's another sign that you will be getting notices that things haven't been paid. Um, another uh, uh, something that particularly with older persons you have to be concerned about with people coming and uh, uh, borrowing money. And so really kind of bringing these things to the person's attention, I think you have to start there, even though it may make the person angry. But it's better to make them angry and really begin to have some focus on the problem because it can really result in financial uh, destruction. And I would just add there are also community resources and supports out there. Sometimes it's an ombuds, um, ombudsman. Sometimes it's an, it's an advocate, a patient advocate. And their role is to, one, make sure that if there's any um, uh, legal support that a, a person needs, that they help with that. And they, pl and they play the role as the neutral party. So they help get those... Um, mechanism in in place if an evaluation needs to be done and 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 so you don't have to do it alone as we said in the powerpoint presentation use those community support supports those advocates those ombudsmen that's some of their role to help with deeming if somebody is incapacitated and making sure their rights are upheld I, I, thank you dr cross another thing i would suggest is that start asking the question even before it becomes a problem, meaning that uh, if you ever needed help with financial matters, who would you call upon to get that help? Start mm -hmm. getting some clues from the person as to who they would trust in terms of doing that. So that can give you some valuable information for future times, maybe not for the person at this moment, but for other people in the audience. It's, it's, it's a good time to start getting that information. Well, those are incredibly helpful points, and uh, I just want to extend my very grateful appreciation to you, Dean Crew, Dr. Cross, and Rose for uh, sharing your uh, great experience and uh, knowledge with us. Uh, we are grateful. I want to ask people to please uh, go and fill out the evaluation. We have a link for you. Um, take the caregiver stress test at familyaware.org slash stress hyphen test, 
and um, you'll find some resources that can be helpful. Commit to practice self-care because you're worth it. Uh, keep learning. Visit familyware.org. Subscribe to our newsletter. Keep in touch. Um, stay hopeful. Uh, there are ways to be successful um, at taking care of yourself and taking care of others. And for the end of this webinar, I want to tell you all to stay safe and be well. Thank you.